interest rates again. Another rate cut? FD rates are already so low. How will I earn a good rate on my spare cash now? Why not use Stash Away Simple? Stash Away Simple? Yes, Stash Away Simple lets you earn a projected rate higher than most FDs without locking up your cash. Just invest and start earning today. Wow, it is that simple. Just visit Stash Away's website or download the app now. Terms and conditions apply. Visit stashaway.my for more information. This is a download from BFM 89.9. The Business Station. The Property Show on BFM 89.9. The Business Station. Good morning. You're listening to The Property Show on the Morning Run. It's our weekly take on all things property related. I'm Sim Wee Boon. 2020 has been a tumultuous year to say the least. From a pandemic to a change in the government here, much has happened in the past nine months. Now, as we close off Q3 and kickstart Q4, how has the property landscape changed? How are buyers, property developers, you and me faring as the Malaysian economy recovers? I'll be touching a bit on these topics today with Dr. Carmelo Felito, CEO of the Centre for Market Education and a Senior Fellow at Ideas. Welcome to the show, Doctor. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. So uh, before we get into how are things like now, let's rewind a bit. What's your take on the government's incentive and how it has weighed on the property landscape? I think that uh, there has been a lot of enthusiasm on the uh, home ownership campaign and some instruments have been deployed to try to, to help the market. But I think that Probably the effect of uh, such measures has been overestimated. Uh, and so I think that in the end, uh, the actual effect, uh, considering also the difficulties that were brought in by uh, the pandemic, the, the movement restrictions, and so on, um, I, I think that the effect has been quite limited. But having said that, uh, um, allow me to say that um, I'm not surprised uh, about this. And I'm also, if you want, uh, satisfied about this modest result because I believe that it's not government task, uh, the one to try to revive certain industries. Uh, I mean, entrepreneurs are in the market. They should uh, make decisions, investment decisions that are consistent with the market needs. And if the products they provide are not met by the demand, they should pay the consequences. And this, in every kind of business, um, in properties like in, like, like in food, if you make a pizza at a price or with a taste that nobody wants, then you cannot ask uh, for the government to help you to sell your pizzas, you know. So given the Panjana incentives that the government of the day kickstarted to address the pandemic and its economic fallout, do you feel that they were more, uh, I mean, they helped the property developers more or, or did they help uh, the Malaysian people more? To be fair, the government tried to help everybody in the country. Um, you know that if I have to be critic of the government, I, <laughs> I don't spare my criticism. But in this case, I think that to say that the government tried to help unilaterally the developers would not be fair. There have been a lot of measures that tried to help uh, all the people uh, that were struggling and uh, obviously the construction sector has been has been affected like all the other businesses. So uh, to be fair, I think that there has been the attempt to try to, to help the generality of the racket. But did measures like the RGPT exemption, the financing limit, did these really touch and make a real effect on rejuvenating the property market? Uh, no, I I don't think so. And um, I've mentioned this before. I think that um, uh, like uh, the, this kind of um, solutions has a very limited impact on the decisions uh, to purchase or not to purchase a property. So I think that uh, uh, what's going on in the property market is mainly affected by the peculiarity of the cycle that the property market is uh, is going through the different stages of this cycle and by the general economic conditions. And at this point, I think that uh, uh, every kind of, uh, of policy would have a very limited effect for what is uh, in the power of the government. Mm, okay. I mean, of course, you know, when you ask on the ground, perhaps the most um, visible 
effect that the government had in the in terms of what they did was the loan moratoriums. And by the time this interview airs, it would have been two days since it was listed. What do you think about it? Like, should it have been extended further, maybe towards the end of the year? Or is this targeted approach much better? I think, I believe that the targeted approach is better. And I tell you why. When, when there was the first extension of the moratorium, I I spoke in favor of the uh, of the extension. I, I looked at it as a, as a necessary move. Um, but then, as uh, as we move uh, forward with the duration of the emergency scenario, and um, uh, we we prolong the stimuli, we have to realize that also the needs of the bank be taken into account. So the more uh, the measures are prolonged, the more it becomes difficult to balance. You know. Uh, the needs from uh, from the people that uh, that benefit from the loan moratorium and the effort that is required to the bank system. Um, therefore, I believe that the targeted approach in which situations are decided cases by cases are um, uh, is is the right way to go. And um, and and probably, and I think, wherever we go for yearly elections or if we go ahead with this government. Uh, what we we need to think next uh, in general, not only for the for the property market, is uh, uh, a sort of exit strategy. We can't go ahead uh, with subsidies and loan moratorium forever, and at the same time we can't remove them uh, overnight. So I think that we should imagine a sort of um, of a bridge policy uh, between the period with incentives and the future without incentives. Apart from the moratorium, another big part of how the government looked to rejuvenate the property sector was the home ownership campaign. From various people I've talked to, it, it seemed that it was quite effective. But like, what do you think about the home ownership campaign? Was it the right move for the government to do? I think that the government did what, uh, what they could do. Uh, again, I think that we should not put too many expectations in the result of this. Uh, it's good for the government to bring together um, to bring together buyers and, uh, and suppliers uh, to try to facilitate transactions. But then, again, um, the priority in sorting out this issue should remain in the market. And, um, and, and I think that also probably in the future, the government should, uh, should look at different priority as, as also the, um, the pandemic is, uh, you know, uh, stretching further into 2021. Um, I, I, as I mentioned also in, in other occasions in the past, uh, I think that home ownership is not really a priority in this moment, in particular if compared with uh, household debt. So the two things are um, somehow um, two, two different sides of a coin. So they are part of a trade-off analysis and looking at the numbers of home ownership in Malaysia and household debt I think that the government should give as a priority, uh, should have as a priority to address uh, household debt right, uh, rather than home ownership. And what kind of uh, policies or moves do you think the government can look into to address things like household debt then? Because it seems a big part of their concern has always been surrounding home ownership. But you and I think several others have always mentioned to look back, appear into household debts. Uh, uh, home ownership in, in Malaysia is already close to 80 percent, uh, so it's uh, one of the highest uh, in the world. But at the same time, household debt is uh, something close to 85 percent of the GDP. So it's quite a, a concerning number. And, and I think the first move that could be done, and uh, this is absolutely in the scope of what the government could and should do, is uh, improving financial literacy. So to find a way um, to, 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 to address a mentality that is very much oriented to fast consumption, but at uh, the expenses of, uh, of savings that are very much necessary to face uncertain futures, in particular in a moment, uh, in a moment like the present one. So uh, improving financial literacy is, uh, is one uh, of that. And second, uh, to address together with Bank Negara uh, the regulation according to which loans are actually issued. Because we have uh, absolutely to avoid what happened around 15 years ago in the Western world when uh, 
when basically loans were given out for almost for free at uh, even at uh, 120 percent of the value of properties this creates financial instability and uh, the consequences of this are uh, under the eyes of uh, everybody uh, the big financial crisis in 2007 2008 and uh, finally, before we go for a break, I know one of the issues that you have been very passionate about is the proposed vacancy tax that the Housing and Local Government Ministry mulled. The minister have since said that it's been put on the back burner, but I'm bringing this up because the tax was touted initially as a way to address unsold property. What are your thoughts on this? And you know, what are some of the other measures that the government could consider to address the issue of unsold property then? Yes, this is a quite uh, quite a complex issue, and I'm happy actually that the, the tax uh, idea was abandoned. But um, you know, first of all, there is the nature of what the tax is. If you look at the, at the tax, tax is always uh, going to be imposed over a profit or over a benefit that someone is enjoying. If uh, you are in the presence of unsold properties. Which kind of benefit or profit are you going to tax? This is taxing a loss, basically. So, um, w- what is missing is the very, the very nature of uh, of the tax. So, the, the developer is already suffering because he's not selling those properties. So, why should he further punish? Um, so, this was uh, one of my main arguments against uh, the vacancy tax. Then I recognize that there is an issue of overhang and unsold properties, but uh, I want to stress that this is an issue of the developers, not somehow of the government uh, primarily. Um, You do um, somehow investment decisions, entrepreneurial decisions that are not, uh, that don't meet any uh, consensus, any favor in the market, and you should... uh, face these and eventually revise your business strategy. This, I think, remain uh, the golden rule. Um, yet, of course, uh, new buildings and new projects are implemented. I, I honestly struggle to, to find the economic ratio behind all these constructions, but I'm also confident that if developers keep on building, they imagine that they can sooner or later uh, sell those properties. From uh, from a policy perspective, uh, what can be done, I think, is uh, look carefully at how um, authorization, construction authorization are given, and and therefore uh, to act at the source of the problem rather than at the end after the projects are implemented. So engage with the developers in a more deep discussion when they ask for the permission to build and see if the project is um, is really something that can be can meet market expectations. Uh, we're going to take a short break right now, and we'll be back after this. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. BFM eighty nine point nine. Welcome back. You're tuned into the Prop Show on the Morning Run. I'm Sim Wee Boon, and with me today is Dr. Carmelo Felito, CEO of the Center for Market Education and a senior fellow at Ideas. Um, we've been taking a bit of a check on the property landscape in Q3 and now we are going to talk about Q4. So uh, I want to ask you, doctor, what's your gauge of the property price trends as in like how has it changed and how might it change from now until maybe the end of the year? Okay, um, of course, without having the pretension to have a crystal ball, but <laughs> I think that uh, we have... Uh, um, we have a trend that emerged already in the past uh, couple of years, uh, and uh, this trend is that prices are cooling down, are stabilizing, so they are not growing anymore at the pace that they were used to grow uh, around the years uh, 2010, 2013. They are growing in nominal terms very moderately, which means that uh, in real terms, so uh, purified by the inflation, um, they are slightly decreasing. And in the past couple of years, even they grew uh, less, even in nominal term, less than wages. That means that in relative terms, somehow homes are uh, slightly more affordable. Um, and uh, I think that this trend uh, will uh, somehow remain. Uh, at least for another year, 
and this is all the more true at the light of of, uh, of the pandemic. So I don't expect prices to go up. At the same time, prices tend to be sticky, so we we, we cannot expect also a dramatic decline in prices. Uh, they will remain at least for the primary market pretty, pretty much stable. Where instead I see uh, quite a correction is on rent. Uh, here prices in certain areas are are going down in a sensible ways, uh, even down 30%. So in some ways it actually becomes a rental market? Uh, this is a, a, the typical scenario in a mature uh, property market where the rental market plays a growing role. Um, and, and so this is even, I think, uh, confirmed by the fact that um, we cannot expect returns from, pop- from properties like we were expecting uh, 20 years ago. Let's say you buy at uh, half a million ringgit and you expect to sell at 2 million ringgit in a matter of 10 years. I think that this kind of trend is uh, is gone forever and uh, a profitability of 10-15% can be already considered quite generous, um, at, at least in the, in the short run. Um, so um, w- w- with this scenario ahead, uh, probably, and, and also with the issue of uh, household debts uh, and more uncertainty given by uh, the extension of the, of the pandemic, I think that the rental market will play a growing role. Well, then, at the risk of having you peer into your crystal ball again, given what we know now, do you think the property market will see recovery coming into 2021 and perhaps what might be driving it? It depends very much with what you mean by recovery. If you expect, I think, a huge uh, jump up in transactions in uh, the primary market, I think this is not going to happen. Uh, I think that uh, there will be uh, quite a long path toward a, a real recovery or a new expansionary cycle of the property market. While we may see, I, I think, a, a more vibrant movement in the secondary market and uh, in the rental market. Okay, but a big stimulant we can look at is uh, Budget 2021. What measures would you like to see included by the government in Budget 2021 to perhaps spur the construction industry, spur the property market? Then it's difficult. It's difficult to say. So what I don't want to see is uh, uh, monetary easing, because this uh, may uh, prolong uh, even let's say that uh, the feeling that. Uh, constructions can go ahead forever. So this is not something that I would like to see. Um, then I, I don't expect, uh, honestly, other kind of, uh, of measures. Probably the only measures that can help a bit would be if uh, other states would follow Kuala Lumpur in lowering the threshold for foreigners. This, I think, would be a very uh, reasonable move. Uh, with all the exception of the case, uh, in a paper a couple of years ago, I was proposing to abolish the threshold for foreigners, for those foreigners that have lived in Malaysia for a certain number of years, paying regular tax. So those people that are actually uh, contributing to the local economy and uh, having a life like, like Malaysians, so spending their money in Malaysia. So I think that this could be something that uh, uh, can... Um, uh, can help uh, in a little bit uh, the recovery of, of the market. And perhaps even address the unsold property hang that we have. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Because, you know, there are thresholds, like, like in Selangor, where the threshold is currently $2 million. Um, I mean, it's quite an important amount of money um, and a quite a financial commitment if you decide to invest $2 million ringgit in a property. And also the, the nature of the foreigners' Uh, living in Malaysia is changing. We don't have only, uh, so to say, uh, rich, uh, rich oil and gas expatriates. Uh, the, the, the scenario is much more variegated. We have teachers, we have middle-level management. Uh, um, so people that would not think to buy a house at 2 million ringgit, but probably at uh, less than 1 million, they would do so. 
what would be your main concerns moving forward that might kind of put stumbling blocks in any form of recovery that we have? I think that what will be required by this government or by any future government in order to really move from containment policies to recovery strategy is uh, uh, developing something on international borders. As far as international borders remain 100% shut down like they are now, we cannot imagine any kind of recovery for Malaysia and the rest of the region. So this doesn't mean to open 100% full-blown immediately and tomorrow, but to imagine and to start discussing with neighbor countries um, a sound uh, strategy for reallowing uh, business travelers and tourists uh, into the country. This will give the real boost uh, to the economy, I believe. All right. Thank you very much for being in the show. Thanks to you for having me. It was a pleasure. That's all the time we have for today's property show. That was Dr. Carmelo Ferlito, CEO of the Center for Market Education and a senior fellow at Ideas. I'm Simwi Boon signing off for the morning run. We've got a 10 a.m. news bulletin coming up next, followed by Enterprise PFM 89.9. The Property Show on BFM 89.9, the business station. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my or find us on iTunes. BFM 89.9, The Business Station.